things look bad right now. The evil, bitter nature of sin seems to press against us on every side. Of course, we have our own sins, problems in our churches to occupy us. Inside too many churches, false teaching goes unopposed. And there are larger problems as well. In the West, in the press, in the public media, even advertising, evangelical biblical social teaching is held up for mockery commissioned to be ambassadors of love, we Christians are increasingly portrayed either as silly or worse, ominous and menacing. Our federal courts are on a campaign to legalize same-sex marriage. Lawrence v. Texas told us that our 18th century federal constitution contains a right to perform homosexual acts that hadn't been noticed before. The speed of the change is breathtaking. Just last week, the CEO of a major nonprofit internet company, was forced out because he believed the same thing that the man who was elected president six years before him said he believed, that marriage is between one man and one woman. Hardly a controversial statement most of our lives. But toleration seems to be a one-way street. Understanding gender to be a matter outside of our control is now understood to be a threatening stance that we've manufactured. So Facebook, as it continues to offer us a chance to remake ourselves in whatever image we desire to present, gives 56 gender choices. And along with marriage, religious liberty, and even reason itself seem to be under threat. Ours is increasingly the alternative lifestyle. Elsewhere in the world, in Egypt, Christians are facing intense violence. Though Christians make up 10% of the population in Egypt, many Muslim citizens are trying to literally drive the Christians out of Egypt. So did you know that last August, in just one day, over 40 Christian churches were destroyed? Christians are facing the worst persecution in Egypt in 700 years. Meanwhile, in Nigeria, Christians are killed. Their families are threatened with death if they bury the bodies because the perpetrators want those corpses left there to show what will happen to people who try to follow Jesus. And in Afghanistan, the practice of Christianity is literally outlawed, as is the conversion of Muslims. It's a crime. The Taliban attempts to kill people suspected of being Christians. And these tragedies go on day after day after day. And we're not even talking about the millions of people that haven't heard the gospel of Christ in in Pakistan or, or Iran. So to be having a conference on evangelism, doesn't that really seem to be a little far fetched? I mean, isn't this the time to be tarring the ark, to be repairing the walls, to be readying our fallback positions? Isn't this time to be calling our lawyers and preparing our defenses? Well, before we sink into a knowing cynicism, let's remember what Paul told the Ephesian church in Ephesians 6. Our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the powers of this dark world, and against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. Friends, hope is confidence that something good will happen in the future. The Bible teaches that destroying our hopes is the work of both God and the devil. The devil either clutters our lives, distracting us with a a multitude of smaller hopes, or destroys smaller hopes in our lives in order to teach us that we shouldn't have any hope at all. Whereas God, in order to draw us to the larger hope that we were made for, hope in Him, He will find hopes that distract us and that obscure Him from our view and lovingly peel those smaller hopes out of our hands. God has a long record of putting His people in situations where human hopes are exhausted. Think of Joseph in prison, or the children of Israel with the the Red Sea in front of them, and the Egyptian army behind them, 
or David before Goliath, or Jonah in the fish. Most of all, think of Jesus in the Garden of Gethsemane, or dying on the cross. As we begin this conference on the pastor and evangelism, I want to begin by frankly acknowledging the fear and discouragement that this topic can cause in the heart of many ministers. We may feel ill-equipped or defeated for a hundred different reasons, or wanting to avoid the difficult conversations that we know will come, the, the threat to friendships. I don't know what you feel like as you're coming into this conference, knowing what the topic is. You may feel a bit like when you're visiting the dentist and you go to the dental hygienist and you feel like you're, you're paying them to pay you to scold you for not flossing more, you know. <laughs> Only this is so much more serious. And for you, for your church, for the people that we would reach, for the Lord that we would honor with the magnificent tidings that we've been given, and on top of all this, we do face a world even it feels more hateful to the gospel that we would share than we did when we first met in this conference in 2006. In light of all this, and to begin our time together, to get the right vista from which to view this topic of leading our churches in evangelism in these days, I want us to walk deep into one event recounted in the Bible to remind us that all we need is the Lord, and if we have Him, if He is with us, we cannot fail. To help us, I want to go to the inspired account of the prophet Isaiah, to the very heart of his book. In one sense, all 66 chapters of Isaiah focus in on these two that I want us to consider now. One of the crossroads of the history of God with His people is found in Isaiah chapters 36 and 37. Isaiah chapters 36 and 37, and you will be helped to pay attention after lunch if you open your Bible or turn it on and follow along. What's recorded in these chapters is the great public event in the lifetime of Isaiah. Do you know what I mean by that? Uh, if you lived in the U.S., let's say from 1820 to 1880, the great public event was the Civil War. Well, Isaiah's ministry stretched from 744 B.C., into the 680s, and there was far and away one outstanding public event in the history of Judah and Jerusalem, and it's what takes place in these two chapters. This is that great event. You could say that just like Moses' whole life was taken up with preparing for the Passover, leading them through the Passover, and then interpreting the Passover ever after that, that he was alive, so Isaiah's ministry for over 40 years was to preach God's judgment and salvation through trusting in God alone, in order to prepare people for this event, and then in the decade or so afterwards to continue to unpack the meaning of what had happened and to teach God's people about Him and about themselves from His deliverance of them from the Assyrians. So practically, what that means as we begin to look at chapter 36 is that the, the glorious hope that the Lord held out to His people through Isaiah's preaching in chapter 35 would be needed because of what was about to come. So let's look at our Bibles, follow the story. As we do, I pray that you will find the lessons here God has for you. I pray that you will trust the Lord alone for your life, for your salvation, for your ministry, and even for your evangelism. Scene one, the Assyrian invasion. Look at chapter 36, verse one. In the 14th year of King Hezekiah's reign, Sennacherib, king of Assyria, attacked all the fortified cities of Judah and captured them. Well, let's re just recall the history for a moment. We're in the second half of the 8th century B.C., that's roughly 750 to 700 B.C. Isaiah's ministry began in King Uzziah's time, decades earlier. Uzziah reigned 52 years, then his son Jotham reigned. Most of Isaiah's prophecies happened in the time of Jotham and his son and successor, Ahaz. Now, Ahaz reigned for 16 years, and in order to save Judah from an earlier invasion, an invasion by the northern kingdom of Israel and Syria, Ahaz put the nation in vassalage to Assyria and to the Assyrian gods. Ahaz began to offer human sacrifices to Baal. During those years, Judah was declining, losing portions of its land to the Philistines, to the Edomites, to the, the Syrians. Syrians. 
In 745 BC, the Assyrians had taken Damascus and subjugated Syria, or Aram. That left the way open for them to move south into Palestine. Just two years later, in 743, the year after Isaiah started prophesying, the northern kingdom of Israel began to pay protection. They began to pay bribes, tribute to the Assyrian king. Eight years after that, 735 BC, the southern kingdom of Judah under King Ahaz began paying tribute to the Assyrians in order to protect them from Israel. In 727, the Assyrian king died. Israel, the northern kingdom, stopped paying tribute to Assyria. But God decided that it was time to judge that nation for centuries of idolatry. So in 724, Assyria invaded Israel, and for two years they laid siege to the capital city of Samaria, finally taking it in 722 BC. The northern kingdom is wiped out. Assyria had a policy of taking captive people and relocating them far from their native lands. They were trying to to squell their natural identity, to, to squelch it, and also they were trying to get them far from the power of their local gods. By their own record, they deported 27,290 citizens to other parts of the Assyrian Empire from the conquest of Israel. They basically decapitated society, demoralized the people, subjugated them entirely. And to top it all off, then they brought in people from Babylon to resettle them in Israel. So Assyria destroyed the northern kingdom. Meanwhile, Fearing all the more, no doubt, King Ahaz continued to reign in Jerusalem. Well, he died, and in that year his son Hezekiah succeeded him to the throne. Isaiah convinced King Hezekiah to stop paying tribute to the Assyrian king. And now, friends, the worst fears of Judah were realized. Assyria, finishing putting down a rebellion in Babylon, turned its full attention to Palestine. The Assyrians crushed the Philistines and Tyre submitted. They defeated the Egyptians, and then they invaded Judah with tens of thousands of troops, and they were successful. The people of Judah were beyond any human help. You see what it says in verse 1, Sennacherib, king of Assyria, attacked all the fortified cities of Judah and captured them. And friends, be aware, the Assyrians weren't merely conquerors and empire builders like the Egyptians or the Greeks. No, the Assyrians were known for their brutality. They would torture people. They would cut their enemies in pieces. They would burn people alive in order to terrorize the population. They would impale prisoners on stakes. They decapitated many. All of these things they show in their own carved records. They were bragging about these brutalities, but they never showed a dead Assyrian. They were presenting themselves as indestructible. So let's say you're in Jerusalem. How are the people in Jerusalem feeling about now? Like God had let them down? If you know your Bibles at all, you know that Hezekiah had carried out a great reformation. He had refurbished the temple. He had reconsecrated the priests. He had reinstituted the Passover celebration, invited even survivors from the northern tribes to come join them. The Bible says in 2 Chronicles 30, there was a great joy in Jerusalem for since the days of Solomon, son of David, king of Israel, there had been nothing like this in Jerusalem. When all this had ended, the Israelites who were there went out to the towns of Judah, smashed the sacred stones, cut down the Asherah poles. They destroyed the high places and altars throughout Judah. Well, if they had been so faithful, why was God letting this happen now? In the 14th year of King Hezekiah's reign, Sennacherib, king of Assyria, attacked all the fortified cities of Judah and captured them. What were the people thinking? Were they accusing God? Were they wondering about Isaiah's decades-long exhortations to trust in the Lord alone? If they had been so faithful, Why was God letting this terrible thing, this worst of all things, happen? Brothers and sisters, take note. Here is a lesson about our fears. In a fallen world, some fears come true. 
Repentance doesn't get us out of all of our trials. And our fears don't always lie to us. Some of our fears come true. That church board may reject your ideas about evangelism. That friend may not speak to you after you witness to them. Remember 1 John 3, do not be surprised, my brothers, if the world hates you. Do you fear that? Some of our fears come true. But the thing is, our fears tend to lie to us about how important they are. We've got to go on. Scene two, the field commander's speech. Look at verse two. Then the king of Assyria sent the field commander with a large army from Lachish to King Hezekiah at Jerusalem. When the commander stopped at the aqueduct of the upper pool on the road to the washerman's field, Eliakim, son of Hilkiah, the palace administrator, Shebna, the secretary, and Joah, son of Asaph, the recorder, went out to him. The field commander said to him, tell Hezekiah, this is what the great king, the king of Assyria, says. On what are you basing this confidence of yours? You say you have strategy and military strength, but you speak only empty words. On whom are you depending that you rebel against me? Look now, you're depending on Egypt, that splintered reed of a staff which pierces a man's hand and wounds him if he leans on it. Such is Pharaoh, king of Egypt, to all who depend on him. And if you say to me, we're depending on the Lord our God, isn't he the one whose high places and altars Hezekiah removed, saying to Judah and Jerusalem, you must worship before this altar? Come now, make a bargain with my master, the king of Assyria. I will give you 2,000 horses if you can put riders on them. How then can you repulse one officer of the least of my master's officials, even though you're depending on Egypt for chariots and horsemen? Furthermore, have I come to attack and destroy this land without the Lord? The Lord himself told me to march against this country and destroy it. Then Eliakim, Shebna, and Joah said to the field commander, please speak to your servants in Aramaic since we understand it. Don't speak to us in Hebrew in the hearing of the people on the wall. But the commander replied, was it only to your master and you that my master sent me to say these things and not to the men sitting on the wall who like you will have to eat their own filth and drink their own urine? And the commander stood and called out in Hebrew, hear the words of the great king and the king of Assyria. This is what the king says. Do not let Hezekiah deceive you. He cannot deliver you. Do not let Hezekiah persuade you to trust in the Lord when he says, the Lord will surely deliver us. This city will not be given into the hand of the king of Assyria. Do not listen to Hezekiah. This is what the king of Assyria says. Make peace with me come out to me. Then every one of you will eat from his own vine and fig tree and drink water from his own cistern until I come and take you into a land like your own, a land of grain and new wine, a land of bread and vineyards. Do not let Hezekiah mislead you when he says, the Lord will deliver us. Has the God of any nation ever delivered his land from the hand of the king of Assyria? Where are the gods of Hamath and Arpad? Where are the gods of Sepharaphim? Have they rescued Samaria from my hand? Who of all the gods of these countries has been able to save his land from me? How then can the Lord deliver Jerusalem from my hand? But the people remained silent and said nothing in reply because the king had commanded them, do not answer him. <clears throat> Lachish, mentioned there in verse 2, was the second largest city in Judah. So, to capture it would be essential if they were going to isolate and take Jerusalem. You know, I, for six and a half years, my family and I lived in England. And we remember going to the British Museum and a number of times seeing there the relief sculpture from Sennacherib's palace that shows this very capture and siege of Lachish. Anyway, you see there also in verse 2 that this, this Assyrian is met by the envoys from Hezekiah in the same place that the Lord through Isaiah, had told Hezekiah's father Ahaz to stand firm in his faith, back in Isaiah 7.3. Well, here in chapter 36 and verse 4, the field commander begins with the question, what are you basing your confidence on? It's kind of like God himself was speaking through this Assyrian field commander. He was pressing on them this question that Isaiah's whole ministry had been pressing on them. And verse 5, you see there, he pushes it even further. He asks, 
on whom? He dismisses Egypt, clearly misunderstood the reformation that had gone on under Hezekiah. He was a kind of diplomat who knew the facts but didn't know their significance and meaning. Yes, altars had been torn down, but that wasn't an attack on religion as it would have been in Assyria. That was a promotion of devotion to the true God, the Holy One of Israel, on the altars, as the altars of Baal and other false gods were torn down. Exploiting the audience, this field commander addressed his unsettling words to those soldiers at the gate and on the walls who were within earshot. And so he gave out his propaganda in Hebrew, and it even feels weird reading these words out loud. It's just satanic stuff there in verse 15 and verse 18, calling them foolish for being tempted to trust in God. Denying in verses 19 and 20 that God can deliver Jerusalem from the Assyrians, putting God in the category with all these false gods. Truth and error are just mixed together in his speech. I mean, it was true that Egypt was unreliable. It's true that Hezekiah had destroyed many altars, that the Assyrians had conquered many nations. But those truths, this commander marshals all in service to the lie that God would abandon his people when God would never abandon his people. Because to abandon them, to abandon us, is for God to abandon his own promises in his word. And God will never, ever do that. Friends, here's a lesson for us about trust. Our basic issue is the object of our trust. It's that question there in verse 5, in whom will you trust? This speech does make it clear how utterly helpless they were. But brothers and sisters, our helplessness is the door into complete trust in God. Has he not brought us there again and again in our own lives? As Paul says to the Corinthians, when I am weak, then I am strong. You see how this helps our churches, our people, in the evangelistic task that we have. Friends, there are not pastors too discouraged to be reinvigorated by the Lord. We haven't met churches too cold to be changed by God's Word. We haven't met people too hostile to be converted by God's Spirit when we preach the gospel. We should go on. Okay, what will happen? What will Hezekiah do? Scene three, Hezekiah hears this Assyrian ultimatum. Verse 22. Then Eliakim, son of Hilkiah, the palace administrator, Shebna, the secretary, and Joah, son of Asaph, the recorder, went to Hezekiah with their clothes torn and told them what the field commander had said. When King Hezekiah heard this, he tore his clothes and put on sackcloth and went into the temple of the Lord. Tearing the clothes like this is a sign of distress and mourning. Hezekiah turns to God for help. You know, he could have tried Egypt. He could have turned to Egypt. Kings before him had done that, or some idols, or to his own military strength, or he could just despair. But instead, he goes to the one true God. Brother Pastor, when you are in a time of increasing hopelessness, where do you go? In whom do you trust? To whom do you turn? This is a lesson about the choice you should make. Choose to go to God with your problems. Let's keep going. That's not all Hezekiah does. Scene four, Hezekiah asks Isaiah to pray for them. Look at verse two, chapter 37. He sent Eliakim, the palace administrator, Shebna, the secretary, and the leading priests, all wearing sackcloth, to the prophet Isaiah, son of Amos. They told him, this is what Hezekiah says, this day is a day of distress and rebuke and disgrace, as when children come to the point of birth and there is no strength to deliver them. It may be that the Lord your God will hear the words of the field commander, whom his master, the king of Assyria, has sent to ridicule the living God, and that he will rebuke him for the words the Lord your God has heard. Therefore, pray for the remnant 
that still survives. Note there in verse 4 that Hezekiah understands exactly that the Lord is the focus of the Assyrian mockery. So Hezekiah prays and he calls on Isaiah to pray. What a simple but profound lesson there is for us on prayer. In trouble, turn to God in prayer. Jesus taught his disciples that they should always pray and not give up. And that applies to you even while you're sitting in your seat right now and listening to this message. Turn to God in prayer. You realize that prayer is what faith looks like in our lives. If we really believe these promises, we will turn and pray them to God. We, we talk to God about things because we believe what He's told us in His Word, that He wants to help us, and that He can help us, and that He will help us if we ask Him to. Through prayer and God's Word, God draws us into His own purposes. Now, of course, prayer is powerful not because of who is praying. I mean, in the text here, we've got a, a repenting and desperate king. But friends, prayer is powerful because of who is prayed to. The Almighty God, the sovereign God of the whole world, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, the Holy One of Israel. The same with us, friends. We actually bring honor to God by believing His promises held out to us by approaching the throne of grace. I often say this at our church in Washington when I stand to lead the pastoral prayer, the, the prayer of petition. We brought God our praises in our songs. We brought God our praises in singing praises to Him. We brought God praise by confessing our sins and saying He says the truth about us. Now let's bring God our praise by turning to Him and asking for what we need, showing that we know He is utterly reliable that we can trust Him with anything that we need. I'm looking forward to seeing what more God will say to us through David Platt's message on this prayer. Dear church leaders, if there's going to be any evangelistic culture grow in our church, surely it begins in our prayers. Pray for yourself. Pray for your church. Pray for other churches in your community who believe the gospel. Pray by name for other churches. I love the privilege of, of demonstrating that God is much bigger than being the God of Mark or the God of Capitol Hill Baptist Church or the God of Baptist churches. He's the God of the universe. So when Ligon's preaching at First Pres in Columbia, South Carolina a couple Sundays ago, we have the joy of praying for Ligon as he preaches at First Presbyterian Church in Columbia, South Carolina, praying for that dear congregation to grow in the gospel under his ministry. Pray for other local churches, Falls Church Anglican, McLean Bible, as the gospel is preached in our area. Brothers and sisters, pray for God's action. Prayer is the preview of God's action. We should go on. The answer comes, scene five. Isaiah delivers God's word to Hezekiah. Look at verse five. <clears throat> when King Hezekiah's officials came to Isaiah... Isaiah said to them, tell your master, this is what the Lord says, do not be afraid of what you have heard. Those words with which the underlings of the king of Assyria have blasphemed me. Listen, I am going to put a spirit in him so that when he hears a certain report, he will return to his own country. And there I will have him cut down with the sword. I love that dismissive underlings or young men in verse 6. You know, neither the Lord nor his prophet is intimidated by the mightiest of men. They are but dust. He clearly condemns the speech from the Assyrian aid as blasphemy. And in verse 7, Isaiah tells the officials what God says his plan is. And you see this lesson here about God's promises. God promises to save His people. God promises the end of the one threatening them. In our churches, we hold out God's promises to one another. We do it when we preach God's Word. We do it when we sing together. We do it when we celebrate the Lord's Supper, baptism. We encourage each other to persevere as we remind each other of the fellowship with our Savior 
that were promised upon his return. We are a people shaped by God's promises. Things we can't see with our eyes determine what we do. Imagine a piece of paper and a bunch of iron shavings on the top of it, and you put a magnet underneath it. Those iron shavings move along with that magnet that you can't see it. Friends, the magnet for us are God's promises. We are shaped by God's promises. We are the people who follow and believe the promises that God makes to us in His Word. And God promises to save His people. So what's going to happen? Will Isaiah's words get back to Sennacherib and cause him to retreat in fear? Let's see. Scene six, Sennacherib's word to Hezekiah. Verse eight, when the field commander heard that the king of Assyria had left Lachish, he withdrew and found the king fighting against Libna. Now Sennacherib received a report that Terhaka, the Cushite king of Egypt, was marching out to fight against him. When he heard it, he sent messengers to Hezekiah with this word. Say to Hezekiah, king of Judah, do not let the God you depend on deceive you when he says Jerusalem will not be handed over to the king of Assyria. Surely you have heard what the kings of Assyria have done to all the countries, destroying them completely, and will you be delivered? Did the gods of the nations that were destroyed by my forefathers deliver them, the gods of Gozan, Haran, Rezeph, the people of Eden who were in Telassar? Where is the king of Hamath, the king of Arpad, the king of the city of Sepharvim, or of Hena, or Iva? So what happened? It looks like Sennacherib had moved to take another city, Libna, perhaps a good defensive position against the Egyptian force. But just to make sure that Hezekiah doesn't misunderstand and do anything while Sennacherib is momentarily detained, it's as, as, it's as if he kind of looks over at Hezekiah and he says, oh, don't misunderstand this. I am not done with you. I'm taking care of this, and then I'm going to be right back for you. And then it looks like in verse 10 that Isaiah's prophecy had been reported to Sennacherib. So now in verses 10 to 13, Sennacherib himself blasphemes God. Sennacherib in verse 10 is suggesting that he is more accurate in his knowledge of the future than God himself is. More truthful than the Lord. But then look at his pride there in verse 11. That kind of pride was characteristic of the Assyrian rulers. I read in one commentary that one of Sennacherib's predecessors had left this inscription of himself carved on the side of the old Assyrian pass in Lebanon, stating that he is, quote, the legitimate king, king of the universe, the king without rival, the great dragon, the only power with the four rims of the whole world who smashed all his foes like pots. I can't recall his name. But... <laughs> But it sounds similar to our passage, doesn't it? Same kind of boasts, same kind of arrogance. The Lord had said back in Isaiah 8, 7, the king of Assyria with all his pomp. Friends, there is a lesson for us here about pride. Beware the blinding, self-destructive effects of pride. Consider the reversal between Sennacherib's estimate of himself and of God. Friend, what is going on if you can get yourself confused with God? Isaiah had already told us back in chapter 2, the eyes of the arrogant man will be humbled and the pride of men brought low. The Lord alone will be exalted in that day. Let me just take a moment and say something to you if you are here and you're not a Christian. Now, I know that most of you have had to pay to be here, and it may seem unlikely that somebody who's not a Christian would pay to be here for three days at a pastor's conference. But friend, in a crowd this large, you may have agreed to come with your pastor and not really said that much about where you are with the Lord. Have you considered how dangerous pride is? That job that you have and all the good that you've done, all, all the good that you could do, none of it, if it were not for good gifts from God, none of it could you do. 
And haven't you seen how pride kills relationships? When you are offended, when people don't treat you as, you, as if you are more than you really are. Humble yourself to confess your sin and to repent of it. Trust in Christ, without whom you have no hope of being born again and being restored to a relationship with your creator and judge. God is a God of amazing love. You'll be hearing about that in messages at this conference, Lord willing. In his love, he sent his only son to die in your place and mine if we repent of our sins and trust in God. We know that God has accepted that sacrifice because he raised Christ from the dead. Christ ascended to heaven and presented that sacrifice to his Father, that acceptable sacrifice, and he calls all of us now to repent and trust in him. If you want to be restored to a right relationship with God, not given to the guilt that's just the preview of the true guilt you have before him, confess your sins to him and trust in Christ alone. If you want to know more about what that means, you could not be in a better room. Just ask anybody around you what it means to be a Christian. But Christians, we know that pride isn't something that's only there in non-Christians. Now, the, the pride left in us after we're converted is insulting to God, and it is confusing to us. It causes us, just think about evangelism, it causes us to care more about what our non-Christian friend will think of us than about what God will do to them in their sins. If we cared more about what God thought of our friends who don't know Christ, and cared less about what they thought about us, we would share the gospel more. If you want to see a practice of evangelism grow in your own life and a culture of evangelism grow in your churches, preach grace and pray for humility. It's like a spiritual superpower. Humility helps everything else. Back to our passage. How would Hezekiah respond to such a threat now even more directly and specifically from the mighty Assyrian emperor. Scene 7, Hezekiah prays to God. Look at chapter 37, verse 14. Hezekiah received the letter from the messengers and read it. Then he went up to the temple of the Lord and spread it out before the Lord. And Hezekiah prayed to the Lord, O Lord, Almighty God of Israel, enthroned between the cherubim, you alone are God over all the kingdoms of the earth. You have made heaven and earth. Give ear, O Lord, and hear. Open your eyes, O Lord, and see. Listen to all the words Sennacherib has sent to insult the living God. It is true, O Lord, that the Assyrian kings have laid waste all these peoples and their lands. They have thrown their gods into the fire and destroyed them, for they were not gods, but only wood and stone fashioned by human hands. Now, O Lord our God, deliver us from his hand, so that all kingdoms on earth may know that you alone, O Lord, are God. What a wonderful and impressive statement of who God is there in verse 16. And in the next verse, what an accurate understanding of Sennacherib's words as being an insult to the living God. And then verses 18 and 19, Hezekiah rightly sorts through the words of Sennacherib. Now, you may be wondering, so Mark, I appreciate you to know more about Isaiah 36 and 37, but what does this have to do with evangelism? Friends, look at verse 20. At what Hezekiah recognizes as God's motivation for acting, for delivering his people. It is so that all kingdoms on earth may know that you alone, O Lord, are God. Friends, the whole point of the book of Isaiah is that all kingdoms on earth may know that he is the Lord. The whole point of Israel's entire history is so that the world may know the truth, that it's not what Adam and Eve acted like they believed, but that the truth is that God who made the world and made them is the God of the whole world, and he is the God even of the person we're speaking that truth to. Verse 20 shows us that this is all about evangelizing everyone in the world, from those on your doorstep to those at the ends of the earth. So friends, here's a lesson for us about God. You get God wrong, and your perspective on everything is affected. But get God right, 
See everything from the perspective of who He is and what He's about, and you'll find that the truth about everything else can appear. The point of all this is the truth about God and His glory. So what would God do in response to Hezekiah's prayer? Scene 8, Isaiah sends Hezekiah God's word about Judah and about Sennacherib. Verse 21, then Isaiah son of Amos sent a message to Hezekiah. This is what the Lord, the God of Israel says, because you have prayed to me concerning Sennacherib, king of Assyria, this is the word the Lord has spoken against him. The virgin daughter of Zion despises and mocks you. The daughter of Jerusalem tosses her head as you flee. Who is it you have insulted and blasphemed? Against whom have you raised your voice and lifted your eyes in pride? Against the Holy One of Israel. By your messengers you have heaped insults on the Lord. And you have said, with my many chariots, I have ascended the heights of the mountains, the utmost heights of Lebanon. I have cut down its tallest cedars, the choicest of its pines. I have reached its remotest heights of Lebanon, the heights, the finest of its forests. I have dug wells in foreign lands and drunk the water there. With the soles of my feet, I have dried up all the streams of Egypt. Have you not heard long ago I ordained it. In days of old, I planned it. Now I have brought it to pass that you have turned fortified cities into piles of stone. Their people drained of power are dismayed and put to shame. They're like plants in the field, like tender green shoots, like grass sprouting on the roof, scorched before it grows up but I know where you stay and when you will come and go and how you rage against me. Because you rage against me and because your insolence has reached my ears, I will put my hook in your nose and my bit in your mouth and I will make you return by the way you came. This will be the sign for you, O Hezekiah. This year you will eat what grows by itself, and the second year what springs from that. But in the third year sow and reap, plant vineyards and eat their fruit. Once more a remnant of the house of Judah will take root and bear fruit above. For out of Jerusalem will come a remnant, and out of Mount Zion a band of survivors. The zeal of the Lord will accompany this, will accomplish this. Therefore this is what the Lord says concerning the king of Assyria. He will not enter this city or shoot an arrow here. He will not come before it with shield, or build a siege ramp against it. By the way that he came, he will return. He will not enter this city, declares the Lord. I will defend this city and save it for my sake and for the sake of David, my servant. <clears throat> Friends, sometimes chapters these chapters are held up as a hinge, as the bridge taking us from the first half of Isaiah with a lot of judgment to the second half with a lot of hope. There's a sense in which that tru that's true. But even more, th these two chapters are the point. They are the point of Isaiah's ministry. Isaiah's ministry was to prophesy and prepare and explain and instruct to bring God's promises for more. In that sense, the rest of the book, the chapters before and after these, form a very thick frame around this masterpiece of God's utter and complete faithfulness in this most desperate hour. And so it hangs there in the hall of masterpieces of God's love and faithfulness to His people from Abraham to Joseph to David, now to Hezekiah, a hall of portraits which all suggest to us the greatest of all, the faithfulness of God to us, seen when we were in a situation even worse than the siege of Jerusalem by the Assyrian army, when we were under threat of death for our own sins. 
that we deserve the sentence. And so God has shown His greatest faithfulness to us in Jesus Christ's life and death and resurrection and promised return for us. So he says there in verse 22 that the Assyrians will flee. You see, in verses uh, 22 to 29, that's really the Lord's answer to Sennacherib. Here, especially intended for Hezekiah to hear and understand, and also his people, he asks devastating questions, like in verse 23. He condemns Sennacherib for heaping insults on him, verse 24. And so in verses 24 and 25, the Lord mocks Sennacherib's pride. He takes these great boasts of Sennacherib and he picks them up and shows how tiny they really are as he sets them down. And you have the climactic, verse 26, where God makes it so clear what is really the case. Have you not heard, little Sennacherib, long ago, all of these things you're boasting of, I ordained. Every single one of them. Every city that you've taken, I ordained that. Here, God imaginatively drops the veil. He, he zooms out. He places Sennacherib's boasts in the context of larger truth like he's been doing throughout Isaiah's ministry. God presents a different reading of the meaning of the same history. You realize how much that's what we're doing every Sunday when we preach. We are taking what our people thought their week meant, and we are helping them to re-understand it in the light of God's truth. The gravity of satanic deception has worked all week long that natural unbelief which tells us we should know is true what we see immediately, and only that, and we replace that in location of God's Word. A terrible event placed in a larger context can appear entirely different. You know what I mean? So let's say I tell you, in January, someone cut my wife's neck. That would be true. That did happen in January. But it was a surgeon. Her neck was cut in order to preserve her life. Do you see how that changes? That additional knowledge changes. And friend, that's just a little human example. No, even the most difficult events placed in a larger context can appear entirely different. Every one of us who's a parent knows this. When you withhold something from your child that they want, What is your child's view of reality? They see and object. They're upset. They know what they want. They know what you're not giving them. They know some facts. They do know some real facts. But they don't understand. They don't have the larger picture in mind. So, here, Satan, we see, always presents a rival interpretation of events. He was doing that through Sennacherib. He does that in our own lives, in the events of our own lives. We are tempted to reread things through the glasses of unbelief and lack of trust. You notice in verse 28, that simple menacing statement of God's knowledge of where Sennacherib lives, and that is chilling. If I'm Sennacherib, if I weren't blinded by pride, I'd know he was saying to me, I've got your number. He's telling Sennacherib, as it were, that he, the Lord, is no local deity. He doesn't just have authority in Israel, in Judah. His statement in verse 29 to Sennacherib about his coming defeat uses the imagery of the brutality, the very brutality, that the Assyrians used on other leaders that they defeated. And in his love, God there in verse 30 promises a sign to Hezekiah. He says the food will be enough. There will be peace for normal agriculture to resume soon. But he should have no doubt that God will completely defend Jerusalem. And why would he do that? Would he do that for the sake of Hezekiah and his pious prayer? It's not what he says. Look there at the end of verse 35. Verse 35. God will defend the city, the Lord says, for my sake and for the sake of David, my servant. God doesn't save Jerusalem for the sake of Hezekiah and his piety, though it was good that he prayed, but for the sake of another, 
for David. David's faithfulness, God's promises to David act in a substitutionary way. The promises that God had made to him are good for Hezekiah because Hezekiah relies on the Lord. You see the lesson there is here for us about the sovereign God and His purposes. Friends, the truth is not that we are great, but that God is. God alone is sovereign, and God will fulfill His own purposes. Of course, they needed to know this during the Assyrian invasion. God's people would also need to know this when they did suffer exile, and then when God brought them back home. Friend, God's people always need to know this. This is not a message that is ever irrelevant. As we go through trials and tribulations in this fallen world, it was Hezekiah's faith in the sovereign God that led him to realize that nothing was impossible with God, that no situation was hopeless. The Lord would always be as good as His Word. Brothers and sisters, there is no peace from God, no peace for us to experience today apart from our faith in Him, His sovereignty the certainty that He will accomplish His good purposes. Praise God for the confidence we can have in Him who has not spared even His own Son for us. So this is what God said He would do. What happened? Scene 9. The Assyrian army is destroyed. Verse 36. Then the angel of the Lord went out and put to death 185,000 men in the Assyrian camp. When the people got up the next morning, there were all the dead bodies. So Sennacherib, king of Assyria, broke camp and withdrew. He returned to Nineveh and stayed there. It doesn't say how the angel of the Lord did this, but it's clear that this messenger of God did it at God's command. Now, of course, the Assyrian records say nothing of this, but then they wouldn't, would they? All their many relief sculptures, and never do they so much as show one dead Assyrian soldier. It wouldn't fit with the almighty image they wanted to portray, would it? God had said that the Assyrians would fail and would retreat, and so they did. God had promised to Isaiah back in Isaiah 14, 25, I will crush the Assyrian in my land. And so he did. Some wonder if God is justified in killing 185,000 people like this, even if they were part of a terribly brutal invading army. I have to say from the Bible's perspective, the question is not so much why they were killed, but why we are left alive. Our sins cry out for God's judgment. It will come unexpectedly and swiftly, Jesus taught. Therefore, Jesus said, be ready. Friends, there's a lesson for us here on mercy. God will save and God will judge. Everything that is not immediate and eternal punishment for sinners is from God's mercy. The last verse is a kind of postscript, maybe 15 or 20 years later. Scene 10, Sennacherib's death. Verse 38, one day while he was worshiping in the temple of his god Nisroch, his sons Adram Melech and Sherezar cut him down with the sword, and they escaped to the land of Ararat, and Esarhaddon his son succeeded him as king. This one who spoke like he was immortal died. He was killed. Some of the very few humans he actually had, in one sense given life to, were the ones that killed him, his own sons. And he was killed while worshiping his god, Nisroch, which may suggest suggest some insufficiency in the protection offered (laughs) in contrast with Yahweh, the living God's protection of Jerusalem. So much for human boasts, a lesson for us about human glory. Human glory is very short-lived. I love John Wesley's reflection. I was in the robe chamber adjoining to the house of lords when the king put on his robes. His brow was much furrowed with age and quite clouded with care. 
And is this all the world can give even to a king? All the grandeur it can afford? A blanket of ermine around his shoulders so heavy and cumbersome he can scarce move under it. A huge heap of borrowed hair with a few plates of gold and glittering stones upon his head. Alas, what a bauble is human greatness. And even this will not endure. Human glory is not what it's cracked up to be, is it? It's cheat and a lie. I've read that within three years of retirement, 50% of all former NFL players are bankrupt, unemployed, and divorced. Friend, this world's greatness, not just in sports. No, it's where I come from in D.C. If you ever come to visit us in D.C., look around at all the statues. See if you know who any of them are of. Even if you can read the name, and sometimes you can't, even if you read the name. When I came to our church in Washington, we had one of the most powerful senators in the Senate as a member of our church. A few years ago, I was making a point and talking to the congregation about something, and I mentioned his name. Almost nobody had ever heard of him. A few members of the church had heard of him because he was a member of the church, but all the young people working on the hill never even heard the name of this man who was one of the most powerful senators in the country. Friend, what are you spending your life on? What kind of greatness are you seeking? I should leave some time for the other preachers in the conference. (laughs) Remember that promise Jesus made, I will build my church and the gates of Hades will not overcome it. Friends, no combinations of killings in Nigeria and jailings in the Middle East and public scorn and loss even of legal privileges, no financial penalties for believing and preaching the gospel will falsify Christ's promise. None of them will. None of them. Jesus has promised. We can join Him in His work to build His church, not only without worry that our work's going to be in vain because someday people won't think Christianity is true anymore and we bet on a losing religion, but in confidence that all our evangelism will most certainly succeed in all the purposes God intends for it. Friends, that is the confidence from which we need to begin these few days together, that God's plans will succeed. And brother pastors, you and I have the, the joy, the honor of leading Christ's church in proclaiming His glory to all people. What a privilege What a privilege. That's all I'm trying to do with this message. Let's pray. Lord God, you have your purposes in your word. You had your purposes in allowing that siege to happen and be defeated, in doing it as you did, in recording it in Isaiah. Lord, you had your purposes in us hearing that story this afternoon in us being reminded now of your faithfulness. Give us wisdom, we pray. Help us to understand what it is that you desire us to do in trusting in you, in our churches, in our witness for you. Get glory to yourself, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen.